Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, wherever in the world you happen to be. Greetings from Time to Come Alive. Yay, our weekly opportunity to have conscious conversation where you have an opportunity to connect with not only yourself, but with some brilliant guests that I have, and today's no exception, as well as use this information to create something of value for yourself, for your community, and your life. Thank you guys so much for tuning in and watching this recording, or if you're here with us live, thank you so much for being a part of this. It's always an opportunity for me to share information or for me to, to have a conversation with somebody that I found absolutely fascinating that I'm sure you will too. Before we get started, if you're watching this live, feel free to share this on your social media platforms so that you can engage your community, your circle of people in watching along with you. And if you're watching this recording, also share this on your social media platform so that you can continue to expand the messages that you're getting, you know, engage other people in your life in these conversations as well. Now, it's time for us to just get focused and centered on the conversation we're about to have. So I'm gonna invite you, if you're sitting, to just make sure that you're planted firmly wherever you're sitting, feet flat on the ground, make sure that your body is supported by whatever you're sitting on. If you're standing, I would ask to do the same, feel like you're centered and grounded. And just take a moment, you might wanna take a couple of deep breaths with some really slow exhales. If you're comfortable, you might close your eyes. If you prefer to unfocus your gaze, that's fine too. Just take a moment to just look inward. I want you to think about the, the topics or themes in your life that make you curious, perhaps even make you restless. When you think about perhaps social issues that are meaningful to you, that you would love to see shift or change or transform. Just bring those to mind. As you have those in your mind, focus on what is your emotion around those topics? Is it pride? Is it frustration? Might it be sadness? Nothing wrong with whatever the feeling is, but see if you can connect to the emotion that seems to be coming up for you as you focus on that subject. Could it be that you need more peace in that situation? Might it be that you'd like to see more joy being expressed around that situation? Or perhaps it's just awareness. People just aren't paying attention. They don't know. And you'd like to see a light sh shine on that particular item. Okay, just take another deep breath. Exhale slowly. You may open your eyes or unfocus your gaze and rejoin us for this conversation. Because my hope is that as we have this conversation, and you'll also connect to this, this beautiful guest that I have, Maggie Abenshine. Maggie and I met serendipitously, I might add, which I love those meetings, <laughs> at a, a Conscious Capitalism event. And if you're not familiar with Conscious Capitalism, then you can Google that. But the, the idea was that we would have a speaker, we had some networking, and I was, I, you know, I went knowing that I wouldn't know anybody in that particular crowd. So I sat in one of the front tables and, you know, lo and behold, Maggie asked, before I even knew who she was or what her name was, asked if she could sit next to me. And I said, of course. And then as we just casually chit-chatted, as we typically would in a, an event like this, we found that we both have a very dear friend in common, Lexi Okeke. Shout out to Lexi. <laughs> and Lexi's actually going to be a guest on our show in the, in the coming month. But Maggie, I'm so excited because I remember one of the things about you that struck me was, first of all, your enthusiasm, not only about the fact that we both knew Lexi, but just your enthusiasm in general about life. And from that moment, it was just like instant connection. We got to stay in touch. Let's, you know, we exchange cards. And since then, we've had a couple of really fantastic conversations, very revealing conversations about one another's lives and our interests. 
and, and your passion for the things that you're doing and that you have done and what you will do in the future astounds me. And that's why I thought this would be the phenomenal opportunity to have you on this program. Welcome. Thank you, Valerie. I'm so happy to be here. And yes, instant, instant connection. <laughs> I'm curious, what made you say yes when I asked you to be a part of this program? Well, you, for one, I just would, I mean, you could have asked me, I don't know, to do something that I hated and I'd probably say yes to you. <laughs> no, I, uh, and I've told you that I, you know, PR is my background, so I train people to do this all the time. So it's a lot for me to, you know, get in front of the camera sometimes. So I think I said yes, because, because uh, we just connected. I knew our conversation would feel like talking to a friend and um, I knew you really understood what I was saying, because it's a new business and you really understand, my business is new and where I'm going with life is new. And you really were able to cultivate um, what I was trying to say because I have a lot of passions and things to say, so. You sure do. <laughs> it's exciting. And I think, you know, really when I started this program, Time to Come Alive is because I just, I'm so committed that people feel inspired and activated, right? They actually not just, feel good, but then go do something about it. And you are yeah. just a, just a demonstration of that. Thank you. Um, Thank you. So let's start with this, just to give people kind of a baseline of who you are and what you're yeah. about. Tell us where you're from, what, where you live, like in general, mm -hmm. you have your address, but <laughs> kind of where you're from, where you live. And then also what your background is that kind of positioned you to go in this direction. Sure. So I, uh, I live in Oak Cliff in Dallas, Texas. I'm very um, particular about saying Oak Cliff because I love Oak Cliff. I'm obsessed with all things Oak Cliff. It is such a magical community. Um, but people keep moving here. Shh, don't tell anybody, but <laughs> um, it's just such a magical community and diverse and um, artistic. So I love it. Um, and my background actually started in Austin. Right after college, I moved to Austin, worked for the University of Texas system and worked for their public affairs department and got really engaged in um, uh, state politics down there and um, learned a ton about public relations. And that's really where I got the core base of uh, my expertise. So public relations, website marketing, kind of found my niche there. And then I found a, got a job here in Dallas at Children's Health and worked um, as one of their media, or worked as their media relations um, specialist there. And uh, that was such a, encouraging, amazing job. Then I found my Mecca, the place where I've learned everything and found my inspiration in life, which was Momentous Institute here in Oak Cliff in Dallas. And they are just the most amazing organization. Worked for them and um, the AT&T Byron Nelson. I was their chief marketing officer um, for them, Momentous Institute and the Salesmanship Club. Uh, and it was just some of the best times of my life. Um, and the only reason I left is because I really wanted to they put, you know, build a business that focused and honed in on what I love, which is I love so many things, but I'm going to take my expertise to tap into all those things. And my expertise is communications, marketing, strategy. Um, and in this capacity, I get to work with a lot of different organizations, including Momentous Institute still, um, <laughs> and work with a lot of different organizations to really hone in my craft and kind of drive what I believe is my purpose in this world. You know what I love about what you just shared, Maggie, first of all, is that you're, you've built on the education that you received through all these different experiences. But I, I, I have a degree in public relations. If, I don't yes. know if we've ever talked about we this. We did, yes. <laughs> <laughs> and, I mean, obviously, clearly took it in a whole different direction. But what I really love about what you just shared is how, as you started the process of usually using the craft, using your education and the skill, what you really tapped into were the issues and the organizations that meant something to you. And I think that's the piece in education that doesn't always get articulated very clearly. I, maybe I'm making this up, I don't know, but that's kind of my experience where people might take on a degree or a, you know, some sort of course of study and don't always find and tap into how to apply that degree or that knowledge, the skill okay. that they built to a cause that means something to them. Totally. Can you share a little bit about yeah. how those two things came together for you? Totally. I spent the last 12 years of my life since I've graduated college thinking, 
what, why did I get this degree? You know, I didn't spend the last 12 years, but the beginning of it, right after I got this degree, I thought, what am I doing? This isn't what I want to do with my life. And, um, but I'm good at this and I can't, you know, and I like where I'm working. It wasn't that I didn't like what I, where I was working. I just feel this, this calling to really do something bigger. And I just couldn't figure out how public relations fit into that for so long. Cause I originally wanted to be a broadcast journalist Mm -hmm. Um, and I thought, man, did I miss my calling or anything like that? No. And then I, I just started really in my late twenties and this, I encourage other young women I mentor to really like trust their paths, um, and trust that like things, all the pieces of their career will come together and cultivate. And I look where I am today, um, 12 years later, I look at every single step of the way, every moment I was miserable, every moment I was happy in jobs, everything has come together to bring me to this point today and I would not change a minute of it. I wouldn't go back and, you know, if a genie in a bottle came and said, do you want to, you know, do you want to be a millionaire in your mid twenties? No, I don't. I want to do exactly what I did so I could get to where I am today. Like I really believe in, um, in that my, from my degree to today, I kind of see all the culmination of why I was led to where I was led in my career. You, in education. you wouldn't want to be a millionaire at your twenties. <laughs> no. Okay, no. <laughs> Money does not buy happiness. That I know for a fact. <laughs> okay, fair enough. We'll accept that. <laughs> well, I don't know for a fact, but apparently they say. <laughs> give us, can you share an example of when you started to see that, you know, you know that you knew that your journey, no matter what level of satisfaction you had in the moment, yeah. was meaningful. What, what did, can you share an example or story about sure. that? So it really was at Momentous Institute when I started to see it culminate. I thought, okay, my time in higher education, my time in healthcare, look at what, where this brought me. It brought me to Momentous Institute, which is their niche is mental health and education, the intersection of it for children. So it was like this, I was like, oh my gosh, could you have taken my background and brought a more perfect job to me? So I went in as um, media relations manager there. And even there, I thought, Oh, what am I doing with my life? Right. You know, I kind of wondered if I was ever going to stop wondering what I'm doing with my life. I'm not, but I figured out how to reframe that in my life. Um, and so in the middle of that, I decided to jump in and go back and get my MBA. And even while I was doing that, I went to UT Austin, they have a program here in Dallas. And even while I was doing that, I thought, Oh, am I doing, you know, am I doing all the right things? I wish I could go back and tell my younger self, just trust life, trust your instincts and where you're going. Like, this is okay. Um, and so I got my MBA while I was working full time as a mom, um, which was one of the most difficult things I've ever done. But really, after I graduated from there, I take it, that was last year, I graduated and I took a year off and really I took a year to grow in every single, like every single piece of me grew. And I saw all of these moments come together, like all these moments where I questioned things and um, like at Momentous Institute, when I first got there, so I had that aha moment. Oh, this is a culmination of things. But then I immediately wondered, where is my life going again? So I took this last year to really figure out that um, it's okay to always ask where your life is going, but also to honor the journey that you've been on and understand that it's all, you're pick, kind of picking up pieces for the road you're supposed to travel. Does that make sense? It makes perfect sense, yes. yeah. So when you say you ask where your life is going, who are you asking and what are you listening for? <laughs> so I am, uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm not a very religious person and, but I, I did, I did grow up very spiritual. And so I, you know, I, <laughs> okay, I'll get very raw. I have a, um, I, you know, I see God as a woman for me because divine femininity is something that's driven me for a long time and is a part of who I am. And so that is who I talk to when I, you know, that to me is God, the universe, however you perceive it. I think it's a very personal perception. And for me, that's what it looks like. Okay. And then what do you listen for? I listen for instincts. I've learned to trust my gut. I haven't always listened to it. I wish um, um, the best thing I heard from a mentor of mine who will be on your podcast soon is she said, um, she said, when you know something's right, trust, like you'll learn to start trusting that feeling in your gut that something's so right. It's like a tingle in your arms and your body, just something that's so right. And so many of us don't know how to hone in on that. And we doubt ourselves and doubt that feeling because sometimes it's scary to get that feeling. You think, oh no, 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 not now. I cannot handle this, but you can. And that's, um, I think it's a tool that a lot of people, it's a, it's a feeling that a lot of people can work to hone in on mm -hmm. and learn to trust. So I, I can see that for me, when I feel what I would describe as inspiration, right? There's like, this is level of spirit that kind of 
kicks up, if you will, my spirit yeah. kicks up. Yes. <laughs> It's usually a, some, a flush of warmth or perhaps like, yeah, like maybe pimple, you know, goose pimples, goose, what do you call it, goosebumps? Yes. And then also, um, and I've recently heard, Marianne Williamson talks a lot about this, is having a sense of peace. Whenever we are kind of in the midst of big decisions or we're looking at what direction we should take and there's, and there's a lot of turmoil and restlessness about what we're doing and how we're going about it, that's generally an indication that we're not really in, on the path, right? Okay. Perhaps there's some things to tweak. Uh, the sense of peace is usually a good indicator for, okay. But sometimes it's interesting because I think for us, and you know, as we started this conversation, I asked for people to think about an area where they might feel restless or perhaps yeah. impatient or dissatisfied. I think those are also indications that there might be something to look at. So I'm curious for you, how did you come to realize that these, you know, you said mental health and education were kind of the intersection that sparked something for you. Why those two areas? What was it about that? So it's really that um, it's what Momentous Institute calls it is the intersection of mental health and education. They call it social emotional health. And it was the first time I'd taken a deep dive into emotional intelligence um, and really cultivating feelings. I've always been a very, I mean, you can ask my parents, I've been a very highly sensitive person my whole life. And it's something I've always fought to get rid of. Like, oh gosh, I don't, you know, the world doesn't need all the sensitivity. And then at Momentous Institute, it was not only finding a place in my career, but finding myself too, because it, I started hearing terms like emotional intelligence, emotional health, cultivating emotion, putting emotions on par with academics or putting, just putting emotions first and really um, instilling that in a child and it it applies to adults too and I thought oh okay these are gifts like these are feelings and our emotions are gifts and truly I what I've learned in moments and I, I feel very strongly about is that I think emotional intelligence is far more important than your IQ anything like that I I, I think honestly it's the key to life um cult like and that's a skill you can grow is your emotional intelligence um, but it kind of helped me find my place in the world. Okay, say more about that. What is it about your place in the world that these two particular yeah. areas, social emotional health, spoke sure. to? Sure. Sure. So um, it it helped me really honor my feelings and who I was. Um, I actually it the mental health piece was very important to me because I'm someone who's had a mental illness almost my whole life. Um, and then that was worsened in my twenties and thirties by some trauma. And I, uh, trauma is also a big piece of social emotional health being trauma informed. And it really helped me put the pieces together about who I was and it helped me start to honor those things. So I started to honor mental health and mental illness and understand that it's not a burden. It can be a gift. I mean, it was, it, you know, what happened is the things that happened are things you wish didn't happen, but it made me who I am today. So mental health be, was a gift. And um, it just start, started to show me that these pieces of me that I've always thought were weaknesses are in fact strengths. Mm. That's, really, that's, that's really key. I think one of the areas that you point to is our feelings, right? Our emotions are not only gifts, but I think they're information. It sounds like you really took that gift and opened up, you know, the open, yes. you know, pulled the ribbon, opened up the packaging, and then took a, you know, I'm not afraid to look inside and find out, okay, so what's happening here? Where is this coming from? Yeah. Then how can I then take this and use it to, to make a contribution to others, right? Yes. And there was a lot in there, by the way. <laughs> a oh, lot of emotions. <laughs> can you give an example of where one of these emotions actually led you to be a, a great contribution to, to, to your work? Um, oh, that's a good question. Contribution to my work. So I think bettering yourself in general is a contribution to your work and, and the world. I think it's a self care and self, like taking care of yourself is an under, um, estimated way to really help this world. The better, the more all of us hone in and take care of ourselves and unroot this trauma that a lot of us carry around, the better we are for the world. So in that sense, the best way I've contributed to my work in the world is by taking care of myself. So I can clear all the mess in here to sh like let this purpose of whatever my purpose is as it cultivates shine through me. You know, I'm clearing all the mess in here 
to be, um, as a friend of mine puts it, a vessel, you know, to be clear the vessel and al align yourself with your purpose. Yeah, no, I can see that too. And for me, it's vessel or instrument, you know, to be an instrument. But I yes. think what you're, what you're pointing to is in any area of life that, that is meaningful to us, the way to be of service and the way to make the greatest contribution is to make sure that we are finely tuned instrument, right? Yeah. <laughs> that yeah. we dust off the keys or polish up the brass or whatever it is that we need to do so that we become the best possible vessel for whatever it is that needs to come through us. And totally. yeah, it, it's interesting because I can see, you know, you'd mentioned earlier that some of those areas of life that you were working through or, you know, really that were maybe, I don't, you didn't say the word hindering you, but it sounds like it could be emotionally hindering not mm -hmm. to deal with some of those things that you found the, the courage and the strength to actually look at them and then use them to, to boost yeah. you. So let's, and well, thank you for, for sharing some of this stuff. And I, we, we'll go back to some of it, but I, I'm curious now because you also have struck out on your own. Moxie Mouth just begun this year, I believe. Or seven weeks ago, yes. Seven weeks. Oh, <laughs> God, like fresh bread. Fresh just bread. out of the oven. <laughs> <laughs> so what was it that led you to that? Knowing that you were already in an organization that was doing some of what you loved and what has mm -hmm. brought you some, some great awareness, what had you decide that going off on your own was the thing to do next? Yeah, uh, that was a series of divine events. Like I've always wanted to be an, I, I didn't know it until I was in business school, but I kept marking high for entrepreneur. And I was like, me? Entrepreneur? What? And then I started to think, yeah, that's, you know, I, it really got stuck in my brain. I was like, that's what I want to do one day. And after grad school, when I graduated, I kept thinking, what am I going to do? And I got surprised pregnant with my third little baby. And he was a great gift for me because it gave me that year to contemplate and calm down and just roll with it. So a um, series of events started to happen at work. Momentous Institute and at and Byron Nelson have been growing into massive businesses. And I was a central serving CMO. Um, and there was a lot of opportunity for them to restructure and grow. And I thought, I would love to help restructure this. And I think it's a good time for me to pull myself out of the equation and really think about where I want to go. And it would help, you know, other people on our team grow. And um, so we, I went on maternity leave and started to, you know, kind of put the wheels in motion. Then when I came back, we restructured. And during maternity leave, I had decided that I was going to open this PR, this PR consulting business, but I wasn't sure if I was going to go in full time, kind of take the plunge or what. And then when I got back from maternity leave, I saw that the wheels were greased. It was time to go. And so I, um, I told them I was leaving and it was very hard because I love that place. I mean, truly it's, it's, I, I love everything about that organization. Um, and, but I knew this was the right move for me. And so I decided to just take the plunge. I decided, let's just go for it. And it was a lot of people say you did that right after you had a baby. And you know, it's such a weird time in life, not a weird time, but it's a, not a time. A lot of people would choose to make big life mm -hmm. moves, but I'm kind of an all or nothing person. So <laughs> I jumped and, um, I was, didn't have clients or anything, but I started putting the word out there and, um, it's been really magical what's culminated from it. I just, you know, I, I took a break between jobs because self-care is super important to me. Um, mm -hmm. I unfortunately struggled with some postpartum depression during that time. And so it was really great that I'd given some time off to really recoup. Um, and then I jumped in and found some clients and what Moxie Mouth does is, um, and this is from my work at Momentous, honestly, um, at Momentous Institute, I worked under the amazing Michelle Kinder, who's a mentor and friend of mine, um, and future guest on your show, I believe. Yeah. Sorry if, if I can plug it. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, and she was such a great encouraging boss in so many ways, but she, um, during our time there encouraged us to really step away from the standard nonprofit narrative of helping poor children and you know this um kind of white savior complex and breaking that down so she um she challenged me and my team to change the narrative and so we made it our strategic goal and we did a huge exercise in really getting rid of words that didn't serve us that didn't empower that didn't um that didn't respect our communities you know we really did work, like how would we talk to the communities we serve if we're sitting right in front of them, we wouldn't say we help 
poor people, right? I mean, you wouldn't say that to someone you're working with, especially children living in poverty. I mean, that's not something that's a conscious thing for a lot of children. Um, and so we really worked, that was hard because the nonprofit speak, especially here in Dallas is, is, I mean, the, it's garnered toward getting donors and saying these words that kind of pull the heartstrings and we wanted to get away from that. So it was kind of the trailblazing moment and I'm so proud of the team that worked on it and they've still carried that forward at Momentous Institute. And I thought, this is what I want to do. This is what I want to do. I want to take my expertise and I want to work with nonprofits and social impact organizations. There's so, you know, even big companies are going into this, um, into the, or big on the philanthropy arm of things right now because we all know the importance of social impact. Um, and so I want to work with these organizations to make sure, sure they're doing it right. I can't change that in the world. I can't change the way, you know, I can't fix white saviorism. I can't fix an us versus them mentality, but I can help change our narratives, which are often our most forward facing pieces on our websites and our social media and our speeches. Um, in all of our marketing plans, if we can get really strategic and filtrate that through all of marketing and communications for an organization, I mean, if you can do it for lots of organizations, you can ultimately change the way people talk. We mm -hmm. live in an influencer culture. So the way you talk influences the way other people talk. So um, mm -hmm. that's you how I found Max now. You said so much <laughs> that I want to unpack. Okay. Yes, let's do it. Let's start. First of all, oh, there's so much here, but you, you, you really, you talked about white savior complex. So let's, let's unpack that for those who might be going, what is she talking about? Yeah. Can you explain what that is and what that means for you. So the savior complex is touchy for people. I think it triggers people sometimes thinking, well, I'm just trying to help. I'm trying to do things. And it's not that people are bad for being philanthropic. That's not at all what white saviorism means. White saviorism is tied into the idea of white supremacy, which is also a trigger word for a lot of people. But there are so many amazing books out there like White Fragility by Robin DiAngelo. Um, I'm Still Here by Austin Channing Brown. There's a lot of books that really talk about this. Um, and what it is, it's, 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 it's usually not in, um, on purpose, but a lot of people are, it's the imagery and the talks and the words that keep um, people of color and white people separated. Mm -hmm. um, so, and unfortunately in nonprofit, a lot of nonprofits are mostly white and we are serving people who are, don't look like the nonprofit, like the nonprofit profile, right? And so when we, um, I'm trying to be, I'm trying to walk, tread. I you know. know. Nice <laughs> it's a, well, and I'm not an expert on the topic. I'm learning. I'm learning every single day. I am undoing so much of my own, you know, biases and racism and everybody has that. And so that's the work I do every day. And I do a lot of listening. So I feel like I'm standing on the shoulders of giants by talking about this. Cause there are so many people who have talked about it so beautifully, but, um, white well, savior is, yeah. Okay. I, no, let's, no. okay. Let's let's approach it from this angle. What was it about you, about that about saviorism or white saviorism that spoke to you? That spoke to me. Um, it is listening. It, in my career, I've had the opportunity to work with amazing people of you know who are minorities or people of color, and I've really soaked in their life experiences. Um, there's good. I'm an empath, so there's good things and bad things about that. But the, one of the best things is that I think I can soak in other people's life experiences. And I feel this pain around it and this like super awareness around um, the, like, the pain of people of color right now and what's happening in our world. And I thought, you know, for a long time, and a beautiful friend of mine told me otherwise, but I thought, oh, who am I? Like, I'm a white woman. I shouldn't be, like, putting my voice in this. Like, what am I? I don't have the life experience. And one of my friends shook me and said, we need, we need people to be talking about. We need people, white people, to be talking about this more. This can't be on the shoulders of people of color. And that struck me. It was a moment in a meeting one time, and it just struck me. And I thought, you know what? I might not talk perfectly about it. I have so much to learn but I've got to make this part of my work. I, ha I mean, this has to be what drives me. So um, really it's just feeling the pain of m my sisters and brothers on this earth and what can I do to play a role in helping in well, any way. I, I feel a little inspiration <laughs> right now. And, and I'll tell you why. I think, you know, I think you, what you said is, is so key. First of all, you paid attention to your emotions around it, 
right? I think the, that's why when we started off the little mindfulness exercises, like, you know, there's, when there's emotion around something, it's something to explore, it's not something to shun or something to be embarrassed totally. about or to avoid. It's usually something to, you know, it's trying to tell us something. Your know, emotions, there, there's a language to them. And it sounds like for you, this particular emotion that you started to feel around working with people of color, you know, people in, in organizations that you were, that, that those that were being served by the organizations you were involved in, meant something to you personally. Mm -hmm. And that's really, I think, where you have, we have the choice to have the rubber meet the road, where we can say, oh, I have these feelings, and I have these, you know, ideas, and now, okay, well, what do I do with them? How do I channel them in a way that can really support or, or yes. forward the cause. And yes. so that, that's one thing I just, I want to point to. So I, I get it. And it's such a complex topic to really get yeah. into. I think, at least from my perspective, Maggie, and I, I can only speak for myself, where we start feeling that sense of aliveness is the path to go. That's yeah. it. For whoever and whatever topic and whatever emotion comes around it, that's, that's generally good information for us to. Yes. So. Totally. And, I, and on it, I've thought like, you know, there's going to be moment when you, it's a, it's a weird path to take because you're going to stumble and fall. I'm going to stumble and fall. I'm going to say the wrong thing. Mm -hmm. I'm going to do the wrong thing. And I just finally had to accept that's, that's what happens when you take a path less travel. Yeah. Well, it's like dancing, right? If you've ever done any <laughs> partner dancing, very seldom <laughs> one equipped in life from birth to know exactly how to lead or how to follow in a partner totally. dance. Totally. Right, but if you're really compelled to learn and to experience tango or salsa or you know swing or any type of partner dancing, it requires a sense of humility, right? Like totally. you know, your toes are gonna get stepped on, you're gonna step on somebody's toes. You know that you're gonna try to lead when you're supposed to be following. You know, yes. like, like all of those things. And part of it is embracing all of it with humility and go, okay, I love this dance. I don't know why I love this music, and I want to learn. I think that's what I hear from you is that these, this yes. is an area that inspires me, excites me. I want to learn. I'm willing to step on toes and I'm willing to get my toes stepped on. Boom. Absolutely. Yes. Beautiful metaphor. Thank you. It, I just, I just made it up. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Another, another area I want to unpack. And this was very slight in, in your, in, in your explanation, but I, I think maybe from a previous conversation it's come up when we, you were talking about how organizations also express you know, the language they use to talk about those they serve, you said, you started to say empower, but you quickly redirected yep. the word to respect. Yes. So I know some, of, some people may not have picked up on that, but I, <laughs> I'm curious about what had you choose those two words or avoid using one versus the other. Sure. So in, the reason I use, so all, everything I do, I try to be really careful not to be uh, self-righteous about these things because you can get in that phase like, oh, and I've been there before where, you know, I'm like, oh, well, we don't say that. And um, that's not a way to bring people into this. It's a way to shut people out. So I try to be very careful. So the word empower is not wrong to use. It's something I'm, I'm just in my job have to be super mindful and I'm mindful that in the word empower um, is still an act of giving somebody something like I'm empowering you. But in my experience in nonprofit for the last 12 years in the nonprofit environment, you know, with children and children's health, with children, with the kids in uh, higher education and especially at Momentus Institute, the power does not come from us to them. The power comes from the, these communities. I mean, the power is there with them. We are just, you know, doing what we can to shepherd it. So I really say we work side by side. Um, we work with these, with our communities that we serve. Even saying that we serve is something I think about. You know, I'm just very mindful of all the words we use. Um, and I like to break things down. I'm kind of a nerd about it. And empower is one of those words that I just try to shift away from. And I also try to read articles and things of people who talked about it and why words are triggering. Mm. Um, and words are triggering for people. And I think it's super important that we as humans evolve our language, um, and be okay with misstepping or getting our toes stepped on during the tango. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yes. So where, where else do you see an opportunity? What language? So besides words like empower and serve, yeah. where do you see there's an opportunity for us to really shift our language to better, to better support this view? Sure. Um, 
So I'll give you, and we, we've talked about this before, I'll give you an example through one of my particular passions, which I've already touched on, which is mental health. Mm -hmm. um, there is so, that particularly, I think the narrative of mental health, if shifted, can actually save lives. Like that is, and I'm not being dramatic, that can save lives. So let me give you the idea, of, like I'll give you um, an idea of this. So when you break your back or hurt your back, you have people just, I mean, what do you, you get medical care, you get love from your family, you're taken care of, maybe some meals dropped off, you know, things like that. You generally, and this isn't for everybody, but you say you have a mental illness, crickets, crickets, or a pat on the head, like good luck. You know, it's not a, um, the way we go toward mental illness is not on par with how we treat other illnesses. It's just not, and I can break that, you know, that's a whole other hour conversation of breaking down from my personal experience and experiences I've really um, dove into of others. Um, it is a lonely, lonely thing, mental illness. And what we can do is if we start normalizing it, if we start talking about things like suicide, which is the, which is what kills a lot of people with mental illness. You don't commit suicide. You are killed by your mental illness because the agony is so unbearable. Um, just these things, if we quit making it taboo, um, I, I really think we can save lives. Like I, I think the key in suicide prevention is so much good mental health care, all these things. But if we just, if we talk about people who are suicidal instead of shunning them, if we talk about it with them, say the word suicide, you know, say like, we know that's the end of this. How can we stop this? That we can really start to normalize this. And I, I, I really think you can save lives if we start changing the conversation around mental health. And there's so many other aspects of mental health besides suicide. That's just an example. Yeah. So for you in Moxie Mouth, how is that going to tie back into changing the narrative? Whose narrative do you want to change most? Obviously, mental health seems to be the mm -hmm. area that sparks you the most, yeah. but is there some aspect of mental health that you'd like to really tap into, or are you just open to anything? I'm really open to anything. I, I'm, I'm a multi-pronged, passionate person. I have, and you know, for so long I thought, what is wrong with me? I can't, you know, I have so many passions. I think that's what a lot of people have, and we have this entrepreneurial hustle culture that's like, focus, pick your one thing, pick your one thing. And I think it's good to focus. <laughs> yeah, I think it's good to focus. That's important, but also it's okay to have multiple passions. So no, I'm, that's why I chose this way to do things. I want to flip the script on nonprofit social impact. It opens the door for a lot of things I care about. And so in mental health, really anything, and I'm not doing, I'm working with Momentous Institute. And so I am directly working on mental health with children there. But um, no, anything, suicide prevention, any kind of, I'm open to it all. So you may or may not have said some of this before, but I just, I feel like I need to dig in a little bit more about this. What is it about language that makes a difference for you? What is it about the words that are used and flipping the script? You, you, may use, these, you use these phrases often. So what, what is it about that? Oh, I don't, I, so I guess we, I've been a word nerd since I was little. I'm a huge reader, been a bookworm since I was little. So words just carry a lot of meaning. I think, I think in our culture, well, I'm an over communicator. That's my gift. I can communicate like crazy. Um, and, but I know that's not something a lot of people have. And I just see how much words carry power for people. They can make or break people. You see speeches that change people's lives. You see um, words or phrase, like small phrases that, really hurt people and can, I mean, we could even talk about microaggressions in a lot of sense, like microaggressions um, are subtle phrases or things that really like kind of dig at something hurtful and painful in a lot of people. And I just think that they're um, being thoughtful with our words is an easy thing to do. We can just be more thoughtful in it. So um, mm -hmm. I don't know if I'm answering the question right. Well, you're a word nerd, so I think that's the first thing to observe. <laughs> so that means you really pay attention to words. You, you are keenly aware that each word that's said is done with an intention, likely, right? And yep. that there's a meaning that's usually attached to that word. And I imagine in different languages to, that there might be some other nuances there. But so talk to us a little bit about, you mentioned like, so this was interesting when you pointed to someone taking their life. It's like no mental illness took their life, right? Some, and that's so, I, when you said it, I was like, oh yeah, I don't think I've ever heard anything phrased quite that way. But what, how do you 
suss out the words that you know need to be transformed or yeah what what do you listen for so i first of all i'm a sponge and i love to take other people's experiences on so when i was talking about people of color who i've worked with and i've taken on like i've really i don't just like hear it i like to soak it in and i've had to be careful about that because it's hard on self-care right but i really um, I'm an avid reader. I look for thought leaders. I, it's just a passion of mine. I'm constantly reading other people's experiences and then combined with thinking about how can, like, what if this happened in their life? What would have changed their life? Like, what if they heard these things from their parents? Would that have changed their life? What if they knew that they could say this? Um, so I, I um, really, it's just sucking in the experiences of others. That's, that's the biggest way I learn. I learn. I'm a huge, I'm just, a sponge about it. That is phenomenal. And who's the audience? Like now, knowing who Moxie Mouth is, your what you're here to transform and what you're here to make an impact in. Who's the audience? Like who are who are the people or the organizations or the social causes that you know need your work? So in um, in the world, mental health is definitely it. Um, I'd love to be a voice in racial transformation. I also would never take those kind of jobs from my um, friends of color who are doing that work. So something that in a supportive role or whatever role I can play there. Um, and then um, I had a third one that we talked about, but I'm blanking right now. And that was feminist. feminism. Yes. And then anything that's a feminist issue. So um, those are my, um, those are what I'm open to. I'm very open. And I'm, I'm also an entrepreneur that does not pretend to know what my business is going to look like even two months out. Um, and I try to focus and put a business plan together, but we all know that's going to change. So I'm really just open right now to what that looks like, but nonprofits and social impact organizations that kind of align with my many passions, you know, if it's animal services, I love animals. Don't get me wrong. I love them. I don't have a lot of experience in that. So I'm not the person for that, but I am the person for, like, I would be drawn to things about mental health, feminism, and racial justice. Those are really the nonprofits and social impact organizations that I would, like, that would light my fire. <laughs> yeah. I, think, no, I, I really appreciate what you're saying because when it comes to, in any area, and not just entrepreneurship, but I do feel that there are things that just call to us on a regular basis. The, the books or the articles that seem to pique our interest, a conversation yeah. that we seem to find ourselves in on a regular basis. And there's so many telltale signs of the topics or the areas of living and life that one should or could really connect with. And I, I mentioned this because I follow Marianne Williamson on a regular basis. So she comes to mind because she usually... Yes unpack certain things especially around social issues in ways that are not common to hear and yeah. those of you know those of us who've seen her performance in the debate stage we already get that but one of the things she mentions is that every single cell in the body has this unique unique purpose right the cells in the liver have a very unique op occupation the cells in the brain have a very unique occupation the cells in the blood there's the, the kidneys all every single aspect of our body is governed by equipment that has a very specialized role. And what I, what, as I'm hearing you say this about these areas that bring you, you know, bring that spark, make you come to life, I can also hear that there are other people in life who, when we struggle with what should I do or who should I serve and what can I, you know, what skill, what should I study, where should I work, like all these questions that usually rattle around about how we interact out here, right? How we interact with the world around us. If we could just kind of go back to, okay, I'm a cell in the organism of humanity. Yes. What's my role? Like, what is it that, what articles interest me? What conversations do I generally typically find myself in that really seem to yeah. absorb my interest? You know? And that might be really, from what you're sharing, and it's, it's so aligned that this, that you've really tapped into those three areas, right? Feminism, racial justice, and then also you mentioned mental health that help give you a vehicle that, that your vessel can now be used and pointed in that. This is, these are the highways yeah. that you want to take. Yes, that's such I, a great way to put it. You actually just clarified a lot of things for me on air. So thank you. <laughs> okay, what did I clarify? Just the simple, like that is such a beautiful, you just made it, you illustrated it very beautifully. So like 
because I absorb a lot of information, it can get a little messy in here sometimes. And you just really, um, you really did a beautiful illustration of it. I mean, it made it, it, it can be that simple. And I think a lot of us get caught up in the noise. Yeah. So, well, you know, if, it, if it's sparks you, then that's, that's, that's your work, at least for now. And, and I love yeah. that you're also very open and flexible about what your business plan actually turns out to be. You know, I, totally. I, I actually identify with that. I feel like I'm just listening for, okay, where do you need me next? What, what, what highway should I take? Should I take an off ramp here? Should I? Totally. Straight? How, much, how many miles should I be going? <laughs> yes, exactly. Yeah. We might make just... speed, but we, the direction, you know, yeah, I'll, yeah, I'll wait for just, a Google in the just, sky. Exactly. Do I just stop for gas over on this highway for a second to check it out? Yeah, that kind of yeah. thing. I was going to, I just have to say with Marianne Williamson, I joke that she is um, a presidential candidate from the future. Like, I think that's where humans are going. Like, she is such an evolved human being. Mm -hmm. And I think there's a collective evolution of, like, I think it's massive. And I think a lot of the divide is because we are so quickly evolving right now, like quicker than we probably have in a long time in human experiences, just quickly, quickly evolving. And um, I just think she is, she's, she's too evolved right now for, you know, like, I mean, she's almost like too smart for this moment in time. I don't mean that other people aren't smart. She's just so highly, um, she's so emotionally intelligent. In tune. Yeah. What I, <laughs> what I get, and I'm so happy for where she's taken her message is because I think what I get, and I've been, a, you know, a fan or a follower of hers for a while is that they're talking about narrative, right? She has, I think, because of now the visibility that she's had, because of the, the clarity in which she expresses herself, that she's really shifted the narrative around some of the conversations that we have around politics, that we have around how we, how we take care of the people in the country. And, and that's what I appreciate. And this is one of the reasons I think, you know, in our conversations, our very early conversation, I was really struck by yeah, what we say matters. I get that. And I think what I also get from you and what you're committed to is that the, what you say matters, what other people say matters. But let's have conversations that really create space for people to uncover what, what, what it means. Mm -hmm. Because we're so quick. I think the way we the divisiveness comes from this is what this word and phrase means all the time. And if you're yeah. saying this is because as you're wielding it as a weapon, or this is what, how dare, we have such divisiveness around the words we use. I feel like we need people like you and Mary Ann and anyone else who comes in that really shifts the narrative so that it creates more space. Like there's more room for grace around really emotionally charged conversation. I think yeah. that's one of the things that, that you and, and Moxie Mouth are here to do. I'm just saying. Thank you. No, I love that. And I think that um, we should, move, I think we are hopefully moving into the space and should where we um, practice self-forgiveness for ourselves for mistakes we made. Like we, I think we have this culture of perfectionism where we have to show up perfect. And if we say, if we do something that's not, you know, if we say or do something that's not publicly okay or hurtful to other people, it's this like, no, that didn't happen. You know, like really trying to shut it down instead of saying, you know what? Yeah, I I said that and that was painful and let's unpack that. Like what you're saying, even unpacking here, you know, just um, understanding what triggers other people and taking a breath as you yourself get triggered. You know, mm -hmm. someone, if something you said hurts somebody or you said words that people are like, that makes me sound really bad. You can take a moment instead of reacting to think why, you know, that hurts them. Okay. I can acknowledge that. And what about that triggers me to feel defensive? Mm -hmm. So Oh, that's, oh, that's some deep work. <laughs> that Always. Work. I live in oh. the deep. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I think that, you know, what you're pointing to, that level of consciousness, which is, you know, in the very beginning of the show, I talk about, you know, the three words that seem to drive me and kind of what I do through not only this program, but what I do in my own business too, is to help support people becoming more conscious, mm -hmm. right, connected and more creative. Those are the three yeah. words that somehow just kind of speak to me. But what you're pointing to right now is the consciousness. And mm -hmm. consciousness requires some of the work you mentioned earlier. Yeah. You know, you talked about being able to, in order to be a good vessel, you got to get your stuff together. <laughs> you know, there's some totally. work that needs to be done. 
how do you, what work do you do? How do you keep yourself clear enough to pay attention to those things? Okay. So it's funny you ask. I did the most egregious self-care thing ever. This is like, and it's not that big of a deal to people, but it is, it is, if you think about it, I committed Um, I committed back, you know, two months after I had baby, I said, I'm about to quit my job. I'm about to start a business. I have a brand new baby. You know, I have two other kids. Um, I know postpartum depression is here and it's probably going to get worse. So what am I going to do? So I don't, you know, so this mental illness does not take me. And so this life moment can be smoother. And so I said, I'm going to do self-care every day, which, you know, not groundbreaking. Right. But I mean, what am I, I'm going to commit to it. So I committed to, to, um, six acts of self-care a day and I do not break it. And I use an app called streets on Apple and I do not break it. I do not break it. I'm like 120 days on, um, some of the things. So what I do, I'll tell you what I do if you're interested. Please. <laughs> and this is what works for me. Everyone should find what works for them. But I do, I decided I knew I wanted to be a yogi one day and I don't know yoga, but I started doing yoga every day started at home. Now I'm um, attending classes at hot yoga and stuff like that. So I've done yoga every day for 120 days. Now Um, I read for 15 minutes every day. I walk for 15 minutes every day, no matter what I just get out and get a walk. Um, And then I take medication every day. I count that as self care. I check that I take medication every day for my mental illness. And I'm, um, you know, every time I mark it, I'm proud of myself because I can feel the healing. Mm. Um, And then I, um, do some other things that I can't remember right now, but there's two other things. I'm not blanking because I don't have the visual in front of me, but those are, it's, oh, I do out. I meditate for 20 minutes twice a day. Mm -hmm. And people think, how do you do this with kids and business? Like you have to take time for self-care. Like I take time for myself. Like I'm a fourth child. I honor myself. And the best thing I've done for myself is show up consistently every day, no matter what. And I've had days where I can barely get out of bed from postpartum depression in the midst of it. And I still showed up for myself. And that is like an act of self-love that I think a lot of people don't do for themselves. And I think more people should. I'm I'm blown away by it. I'm like, I feel a lot of healing happening from it. Um, I just don't think anybody, I I just think I've never shown up for myself like this. And it's been a magical experience and I will continue to do it. That's really brilliant. So you've selected, you're being really mindful about selecting activities that help give you your center. First yeah. of all, spark that. If you've never done this before, what made 120 or whatever, 180 <laughs> days ago for you to say, here's the five things that I'm going to give myself every day? The, the knowledge of, t- well, really my husband, who's my like partner in life and everything, we kind of sat down and said, okay, you're doing all these things. And he, he, is, he takes care of me so well. You know, I don't let people take care of me, but he just does. And he's so good at it. And he's like, what are we doing to take care of you during this time? And I said, you're right. I'm, I cannot afford a mental breakdown. I can't afford anything like this right now, but I want to do all these things. I feel this calling. Um, so what do I need to do? And so we sat down and I talked through, this is what I think would be the best way to take care of myself. And so I, that's, that's really all that happened. Nothing super crazy, just a moment where I knew I needed to do something. Well, but I think the, the thing that strikes me is your presence of mind, you're experiencing postpartum depression, right? You're already in it, it sounds like, when all of these things start to kind of come up. And then to have the presence of mind to have a conversation with your life partner, right? Your husband to go, yeah. how, do we, how do we counteract or how do we balance or how do we manage yeah. what's happening? What, what gave you the presence of mind to have those conversations? I know in my mind, yeah. I imagine postpartum depression can be so debilitating for some that okay. you don't even have the moment to think about this. Yeah. Well, I can back up a little bit. I did go through, I, I'm a big believer in therapy. I mean, Momentous Institute does therapy. I, I, that's part of the reason I'm drawn to their work there. But like I, and I don't do, I do therapy through an adult therapist, but um, I believe in therapy so much. For me, I found a psychologist that really helped me unpack a lot of trauma and was able to bring me to a place where I wasn't carrying this heavy burden all the time. And I could work through things like postpartum depression that showed up and Um, so really therapy and she encouraged acts of self love. And then really, again, soaking in best practices of people I love and aspire to be like, Mm -hmm. so, um, actually at our conscious capitalism event, Michelle Kinder was our speaker and she, uh, showed her streaks 
and had done that. And I'd already, I'd just started it. Um, and I think, and so it made me think maybe she inspired that. I just couldn't remember what inspired me to, um, do this race like that, but really it was that I needed to do a major act of self care and I didn't have the, I'm, I couldn't go across the country, like to India and live in a, you know, do yoga for a month. <laughs> yes, I did not have that luxury. So I had to do something. And to me, that is, it's just as courageous to show up for yourself every day. Yeah. So it's oh. something I'm very proud of. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah, you, you should be. I think the acts of self care, I love that you said they're egregious acts of self care. Like, yeah. no matter what, I'm taking care <laughs> of myself. And the fact that you consider yourself a fourth child, <laughs> how did that help? How? Because again, going back to narrative, narrative sometimes when it comes to self-care can be a bit, as mm -hmm. for some, interpreted as self-serving or, yep. right, or selfish. What, how did you get to the point where you thought, no, this is, I'm going to treat myself as well as I treat my kids? Yep, exactly. Well, because, because of my kids. I, um, I had to, I, like, everyone's inner child needs healing, right? Everyone has some pain that their inner child carries. And I, you know, they, there's a lot of, you might have heard the term ancestral trauma or generational trauma. If I don't fix, everybody has it. If I don't work on myself to fix that, I'm not like, I need to be the best mother I can be for my child. And that's the best mother I can be by stopping any crap that I'm carrying within me to give to them. So taking care of myself is an act of love for them. It's an act of love for my marriage. It's been a beautiful thing for my marriage. Um, it's also shows, you know, I've seen my husband kind of transform during this, like just living with him. He's like, well, I'm, he's never done yoga a day in his life. Now he's a yogi. And <laughs> <laughs> you know, it, 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 you're practicing what you preach. You want your kids to take care of themselves. Like, yeah, you might think it's selfish to take care of yourself, but would you ever tell your kids you're, you know, mm, you're selfish for wanting some time alone or for meditating or for taking care of your body. That's, you know, it's really just loving yourself like you love the people that you love the most in your life. Oh, beautifully stated, beautiful stated. I love that. And I do think that there's, there's something to be said for finding a way to provide ourselves with the self-care that means something to us. Right? Exactly. You're, you're clearly connected with some, some exercises and activities and practices that speak to you. And so self-care looks different for everyone. But, it, but I think what, what you're stating is that honoring what your body your mind your soul your emotions needs in order to be to be well right to be yeah. to be cared for is the key totally wow. self-care is not selfish that's self -care. A, that's a mantra yes <laughs> self-care is not selfish <laughs> wow maggie this has been a phenomenal conversation thank you so much for sharing so much of yourself what was it like for you it was awesome. I feel like we're sitting at coffee like the first time we met right now. I've even got my coffee right here. This has hey. been so awesome, Valerie. I just love talking to you. You've got such a beautiful soul. Oh, thank you so I much. Appreciate Bye -bye. It. Thank you so much. Yeah, I think you've shared some really wonderful things for us to think about. Now, in the, in the show notes, I'll make sure to include the books that you mentioned. I think those might make a difference for people. Mm -hmm. Also, information about your company. But is there anything about yourself that you'd like to share as we wrap up? Um, what you're doing. I, I, no, I don't know. I'm trying to think if there's anything else I'd love to share. I feel like we've shared so much today. Um, if there's anything I can leave people with is the last topic we talked about, which is take care of yourself. It's the best thing you can do. It's the greatest act of love you can do for people around you. Greatest gift. Excellent. Thank you so much. I said, like I, like I said, you'll, Y'all will get information on how to get connected with Meggie here. So if you're interested in Moxie Mouth and their services, feel free. Or any of the things that she shared that would be wonderful life hacks for you. We'll make oh. sure to provide that. And people can get in touch with me uh, through Instagram, Facebook. Moxie Mouth has Facebook pages there. And um, I'm, you can check me out there. It's, at, it's Moxie Mouth is the tag. Okay, perfect. And I'll make sure to add those two to the link Thank so that people can get easy access. Thank Good. You. Thank you all so much for joining us and listening in on this wonderful conversation. So enlightening. Next week on October 29th, we're going to have Sandy Minogue. She is a wonderful storyteller and also a prayer warrior. Happens to be one of my favorite prayer partners. And I think she'll, her story will absolutely uh, humble you, but also inspire. So looking forward to having that conversation. 
Hope that you all join us once again next week for Time to Come Alive on Tuesday, 845 Central. Thank you so much for joining us. Maggie, once again, thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you, Valerie. All right. Have a great day, everyone.